Hi, everyone. Uh, so um, I'm Dominic Williams from Infinity, and um, I'm going to give you a quick talk on uh, fast agreement in decentralized networks. Um, this uh, aims to give you a sort of high-level view of what we're doing um, without getting into too many gory technical details. Uh, so um, first of all, uh, what is Definity? We're um, creating a network that will produce this thing we call the internet computer, uh, which is a sort of decentralized public uh, compute cloud or platform, if you like. And we aim to host the world's next generation of software and internet services. So um, producing fast agreement amongst the nodes in a potentially very large, large network is uh, important to us. So uh, we'll just start off by um, looking at traditional consensus versus uh, you know, blockchain agreement trade-offs. Um, so um, generally speaking, you, know, you have, uh, I mean, distributed computing has long had a branch uh, that's produced something called consensus protocols, uh, which are based on message passing and produce deterministic uh, agreement or finality. So um, everybody runs this protocol, and on the termination of the protocol, uh, everybody uh, knows that um, something's been agreed on. Um, blockchains work a little bit differently. Uh, you don't get deterministic agreement. Instead, you get prob probabilistic um, agreement. So that means that the finality of an agreement becomes m more and more certain over time. So I mean, if you think about Bitcoin, um, you know, we typically say that a block has to be buried six blocks deep before we decide that it's truly permanently in the chain and the data inside of it's been agreed upon with um, overwhelming probability. So if you think about a, a, a creating a blockchain with something like PBFT, like prob uh, practical Byzantine fault tolerance, it's a popular um, traditional consensus protocol, well, uh, you know, it's going to give you finality at every block. Um, that's great, obviously, and potentially can go very fast. Um, liveness is lost. That means it won't progress uh, if, if, it's, if timeouts that are built into the protocol are triggered. That's a disadvantage. And uh, if you want it to run um, quickly, you, you need, need to... Um, make sure only a small number of nodes, a relatively small number of nodes are running it. Um, by contrast, uh, blockchains uh, produce probabilistic finality from a chain of, chain of blocks. So, you know, uh, nodes in the network are producing blocks. These are being assembled into some kind of data structure, typically a chain, but it can be all kinds of other stuff. DAGs are very popular today. And uh, by watching the emergence of this structure, this structure that you know all the different nodes are building, um, you can make assumptions about the finality. So um, with respect to liveness and synchrony, uh, we've seen PBFT fails if uh, there's too much of synchrony and the timeouts are triggered. Um, a blockchain, um, slightly different situation, you know, you can look at the level of a synchrony in the network and the block time, and from that um, you'll get some um, level of consistency. And consistency refers to the time it takes to finalize agreements. So <clears throat> I think it's fair to say that blockchains are more resistant to uh, asynchrony, asynchrony being you know, uncertainty or variance in the delivery time of messages than traditional consensus. And they um, also scale to much larger numbers of nodes, which is great. Um, just a quick comment uh, regarding the point about asynchrony and uh, block time changing the consistency. You know, bit in, with Bitcoin, people always say, look, six blocks gives you finality, and there's no um, asynchrony input there. And the reason is that Bitcoin uses a 10-minute block time. Because the block time is so large, um, it, you know, reduces the importance of the level of um, asynchrony in the network. But, you know, if you took Bitcoin and reduced the block time from 10 minutes to 10 seconds, well, you sure as hell couldn't, couldn't uh, 
believe something uh, that had been confirmed six times was final with overwhelming probability, right? So, you know, the, the, the uh, thing still holds there. Um, just quickly, um, uh, let's just think about how we might get all the best properties. So, um, you know, there's a thing called FLP, you may have heard of it, that um, basically meant that with a where there's a synchrony in the network, you need to drive consensus probabilistically. Um, the reason for the practical Byzantine fault tolerance protocol is that it's faster, and so they've designed a protocol that will only progress under synchrony, i.e., you know, it'll only progress as long as these timeouts aren't triggered, but um, uh, if that happens, it's still safe, it just doesn't progress, but it performs much better, and that's a kind of trade-off from that uh, that causes a lot of people to choose it. Meanwhile, you know, blockchains um, have a better fault bound, or can do, and are kind of better at handling asynchrony. So what we really want to do is, uh, you know, bring traditional consensus protocols um, in, the direction, in the direction of better fault tolerance and being able to, uh, you know, maintain their performance with far greater numbers of nodes at uh, scale, and we want to bring blockchains in the direction of fast determination. So to do this, um, we're going to need randomness. So without getting to the reasons why, I mean, you can just intuitively see, for example, that, you know, Bitcoin itself depends upon random number generation through proof of work. So let's just think about using proof of work to generate randomness. So, you know, in proof of work, there's a global hash search as a competition to find an input, an input that produces an output hash that's beneath the target called the difficulty. So what's good about that system for producing random numbers? Well, firstly, it's unstoppable. Um, there's always going to be someone producing a hash somewhere. Um, it's difficult to manipulate, at least at scale. Um, the random numbers are easily verified. You can just put the data into the hashing algorithm and check that you get the same hash. It's not so easy to find the input that produces that hash, right? That's the whole difficulty involved in mining. Um, and it's O1 communications complexity. Everyone just, you know, looks, looks for an input that produces a hash beneath the target, and when they found one, they, they broadcast it. So what's bad about it? Why couldn't we use uh, proof of work uh, to generate the randomness for, this, uh, the, for, for the system we're looking for? Well, firstly, um, you know, proofs of work um, aren't generated on demand, right? You know, they're generated according to a Poisson distribution, right? i.e. whenever anyone happens upon them in their brute force search. And furthermore, the sequence of random numbers uh, must be finalized by the chain. So um, this inconsistency in the chain makes candidate random numbers uh, visible ahead of time, which we probably don't want. And of course, um, flaws like selfish mining um, could lead to manipulation in the, of the sequence of random numbers. And, this thing called orbuculum attacks, where somebody can see the future. Um, and last but not least, there's a huge amount of energy costs and environmental damage uh, associated with it. So uh, anyways, uh, this is the first protocol I'm going to just introduce very quickly at a high level. Um, it's called Threshold Relay. And uh, it's the, this, this is the uh, mechanism we use to produce random numbers, um, which will drive protocols that will produce um, agreement in, in a better way. So um, this is pretty much the only semi-complex diagram in these slides, and uh, it just uh, aims to show how unique deterministic threshold signatures uh, work. And these are the same as, uh, kind of the same as like a tra tradition, traditional public key signature scheme. There's a public key, and there's a private key that can be used to create a signature on a message. The difference is that the private key is actually shared amongst the members of group. So the group has a public key, right? Like you, you might have a public key pair yourself that you can use to sign things. You keep your private key private and you tell everyone about your public key and you could then sign things and they'll be able to verify your signature, right? This is just the same, except this time the public key belongs to the group and the private key is distributed amongst the group members, such that um, you know, if a message is presented to the group, 
the group members can collaborate to create a group signature on that message, right? And the nice thing is that it's a non-interactive process. Um, you know, and it's called, a th it's called a threshold signature scheme because you don't need all of the group members to participate. So for example, if you wanted, you could have a group of 200 and only, sorry, 400 and only 201, that's the group size we use, only 201 would need to collaborate to create the group signature on a message. And it doesn't matter, the great property is it doesn't matter which uh, subset participate. You always get the same output signature. That's why it's called a unique deterministic threshold signature scheme. Which if you think about it, it's a kind of magic property, right? So if you have a group of 400, present it with a message. Um, it doesn't matter, in, in our case, which subset of 201 um, collaborate to create the group signature. The group signature will always be the same. There's only one possible out, output message um, that the group that, that's valid that the group can create. So um, it's it's non interactive thing. People just broadcast their signature shares, and you can just they've got private key shares, and they broadcast their signature shares, and you can combine any any 201 signature shares, and uh, boom, you've, you you can create the group signature. Um, and of course, uh, we're using this as a deterministic random number, and uh, that's also verifiable, right? Because you can verify the random number, the signature, against the input message and the group's public key. Um, we'll come back to some of the properties in a second. These groups uh, that we uh, use in Threshold Relay are set up using a one-round uh, distributed key generation, or DKG. So, um, you know, what we typically do is we assign random uh, nodes to a group and they then participate in this fault tolerant DKG. Um, essentially, that involves each uh, participant in the group becoming a kind of dealer and dealing out some randomness to the other members together with a zero knowledge proof to show that they've done it correctly. And you only need a threshold of these guys, or not even a threshold, less than the group's threshold to, to do this, to actually set up the group successfully. Um, so, um, you know, the general properties um, that I mentioned, um, with respect to the DKG, there's no trusted dealer required. Every group participant has the opportunity to be a dealer and distribute randomness to the uh, other members. Um, it's a non-interactive system, so the signature shares um, are created and combined independently, right? So if you present, if there's a message to be signed, the members of the, you know, the members of the group can just broadcast these signature shares, and you can combine uh, a, a threshold, you know, a threshold number from any subset to create the, out, the group's output signature, right? And it'll always be the same. It's completely non-interactive. It's fault tolerant, of course, because you only need a threshold of the group to uh, participate in this. So, you know, if you've got a group size of 401 and, uh, you know, a threshold of 201, well, if 100 are faulty, if 100 of that group are offline, well, you've still got 300, right? You only need 201 to produce the next signature. So um, that's a really nice property. And of course, it's unique um, because there's only one valid signature per input message. Only one valid in, there's only one valid input. Um, there's only one valid signature per input message, which means it's unmanipulable, right? So, um, with respect to the randomness property, um, it must be the case that each signature output by the group is uncorrelated with the input message. Otherwise, the cryptographic security proofs um, would, would be violated, right? I mean, forgetting the group situation for a moment, if you had a public key pair and someone presented you with a message, right? When you sign that message, you put a signature for that message using a, your private key, if there was some way of correlating right, that message you were presented with with a signature you're going to produce, well, it wouldn't be secure, right? People could predict what your signature is and try and forge one. 
So the signature must be a random number. So the basic idea here is that we have a bunch of groups um, set up in the centralized network, and we're just going to relay from group to group with each group signing the previous group's signature. And if you're interested, the reason we have lots of groups, we're always constantly uh, creating new groups and expiring groups. And the reason we do that is to defeat an adaptive adversary that might seek to corrupt the members of a group. Because the groups only last for a short amount of time, you know, and the, the composition of new groups is random, it's not possible for an adaptive adversary to um, spend, you know, spend, some, spend some amount of time corrupting these groups, because they only exist for a short time. So um, otherwise, of course, you could just have a, you know, the same group of 400 just r relaying um, from between itself, right? And um, between signatures that it created itself. But uh, as it is, we have, uh, you know, quite a few groups in the network and uh, relay between them. So uh, here's a group of yellow nodes. <laughs> They've produced a signature. That signature selects, in this case, the pink group. The pink group, um, you know, the members of the pink group <clears throat> broadcast signature shares on the previous uh, signature. And um, those are combined, and this selects the next group, and so on, ad infinitum. So uh, let's think about um, fault tolerance. Um, what could make this production of random numbers fail? Um, well, uh, let's, let's imagine that you know, there's a universe of nodes. I mean, we're hoping for millions of nodes eventually, but um, maybe much less initially. And let's say 30% of them um, are faulty. I mean, faulty just means right, could, they can behave arbitrarily, right? Uh, maybe they're offline. Maybe they're controlled by a single adversary or whatever. And we want to take a random sample, i.e. one of these groups. So we're going to say, take a sample of 400, right? Um, obviously, the chance that, because it's a smaller sample, and there's going to be you know, a sample of the, the universe, there's going to be some variance. And um, you know, there's, there's a chance that uh, you know, maybe 50% of the group are um, faulty. So anyway, here's a, a concrete example. So let's, let's imagine that we've got 10,000 nodes in the Definity network. It's like 10,000 10, machines running out of data centers. <clears throat> and of those 10,000 nodes, 3,000 are faulty, can behave arbitrarily, or, or maybe they're just offline, say, um, and 7,000 are correct. And the group size is 400, and the threshold is 201. So um, for a group to fail and not produce uh, the next round of number, 200 or more of the group would have to be faulty. So imagine you've got 10,000, a universe of 10,000 nodes, uh, 7,000 are correctly functioning, 3,000 are faulty, and we take a random sample of 400 and turn it into a group. What is the probability that 200 or more of that group are faulty, and therefore the group won't, won't produce the next random number on demand and, and the, the network will stall? Well, um, you can uh, just use hypergeometric probability to calculate this. It's pretty straightforward. And you, you'll see that, that the probability of this happening is 10 to the minus 17. So to put that in perspective, um, you know, if you're aiming to produce a new random number every two seconds, then faulty nodes can stall the network um, on average once every 6 billion years. right? So not too much to worry about there. And if, if we felt that 10 to the minus 17 wasn't safe enough, well, we could increase the group size to 500, and then it would be 10 to the minus 23. And I'm not even going to try and guess um, you know, how, many, how many years that is. So clearly, we have a mechanism that um, uh, is extremely robust. Um, so there's some really nice you know, properties um, that are produced by our decentralized VRF. Um, Firstly, it's completely unmanipulable. It's unmanipulable because it's deterministic, right? Given some input, a group can only produce a single valid signature, right? It's, it's deterministic. 
there's no wiggle room. Um, everybody can validate the, the random numbers that are put out there just by verifying the signature against the public key in the message, right? The previous message. So the system is completely unmanipulable. There's absolutely no way to manipulate this. Um, it's unstoppable within reasonable fault bounds, and we've just seen that in a network with 10,000 nodes, and um, of which 3,000 are faulty, if, if the group size is 400 and the threshold is 201, um, you know, the probability of failing uh, to produce a new random number is 10 to the minus 17, uh, which would occur once every six billion years if we were doing this once every two seconds. And if we're not happy with that, we can just say, right, let's use a group size of 500, and now it's 10 to the minus 23, and you know, trillions of years or something. So it's unstoppable um, within reasonable fault bounds. It's, of course, unpredictable, even though it's deterministic. You know, the sequence is deterministic, which makes it unmanipulable, but it's unpredictable because the next random number can only be produced with the agreement um, of at least one correct process node, whatever you want to call it, in, in, in the next group, right? So these random numbers are produced on demand at the right moment when the protocol demands they're produced. And it's not possible to generate these random numbers ahead of time because the generation of each random number requires the participation of correct nodes, which of course follow the protocol. Um, it's extremely fast and efficient. So this is one of the kind of mind-boggling pieces about this protocol. Um, with a group size of 400, uh, threshold of 201, you know, you're only going to need to like broadcast about 22 kilobytes across the network to generate each number. Um, so you know, typically with a, with a threshold of 201, once you've collect, you know, once a node in a P2P um, broadcast network uh, has received 201 uh, signature shares, combined them, produced the signature, they just you know relay that, and they don't relay any more shares. Um, so it's quick, right? It's incredibly quick. I mean, you could have you know millions of nodes in a decentralized network or connect, you know, P2P broadcast network, and just like 22 kilobytes of data has to ripple across that network in order for um, the next random number number to be to be produced. Um, so, like a, just a basic intuition about this is that you know we've just sort of lent on the power of cryptography itself to produce random numbers. In contrast to, for example, you know, like proof of work does it, which is a, a sort of global brute force search um, for, for, for an input that produces a hash but beneath a number, right? Um, where the more energy you burn, the more CO2 you produce, the greater your, problem, the greater your chances of, uh, of being the one who discovers the next random number and gets a reward. Um, not only is, um, you know, this system, you know, you have to, there's no like chain consistency, consistency or anything like that. Not only is the system, uh, you know, completely deterministic, we've gotten the entire network, no matter how big it is, to agree on the sequence of random numbers without running a consensus protocol. So the intuition is if we can use that, um, you know, sequence of random numbers to drive uh, a consensus protocol of some form, right? Um, it's going to be um, super fast. So probabilistic slot consensus. Um, we're not going through the details of it here because I didn't think we'd have time and we can have a short Q&A. Um, essentially, it works like this. At each new block height, the random beacon uh, places all of the nodes into a priority order. So um, obviously, the, the priority order is virtual, right? If you have a you know, you, if your central ledger maintains a record of all of the nodes in your network, even if there are millions of them, you can just apply a function to sort them, right, into some random order. And, you know, there'll be the higher... We, what, we, what we say is there's like a slot zero, and that's the highest priority node, the first in the ordering, and slot one, slot two, and so on. And we then say that nodes produce blocks which are scored um, according to their priority. So, um, you know, I think it's one point for the slot zero uh, node, half a point for the slot one node, quarter a point for the slot two node, and so on. So in some ways, that's analogous to the way proof of work network might, um, you know, look at the work involved, if you like, 
that's, that's gone into producing the hash, or you know how, how small the, the hash num the hash is um, pr produced by some input. It's not so different, and that's it. You have a blockchain. It's not very difficult to do. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm glossing over lots of complexities and details, and um, but essentially, just the, this is the fundamentals of a blockchain. Um, and it's already pretty quick because we have, <clears throat> um, you know, we're able to produce the randomness to drive it so efficiently. Um, there are some special considerations um, with this kind of blockchain. So we we um, uh, add some, we do some other things too to drive higher consistency. So one of the key parts of the design of probabilistic log consensus is we reuse those threshold groups to notarize. Um, valid blocks. So a block is only valid if it's notarized by the current threshold group. And the reason we do that is it forces um, uh, nodes to broadcast forks. So, you know, if there's like a, a block that might fork the chain, right, and it's not broadcast, well, that fork won't get notarized, right, and it'll die just like that. Um, and that's one of the ways we, you know, drive higher consistency. Um, I won't go into trying to explain how this works, but there's a special case where you can get optimal finality in, in two blocks in a relay. So, um, you know, what does this all mean? It means that you can get um, agreement, you know, finality on agreements in, in, in under five seconds in, you know, massive decentralized networks, um, which, um, you know, is a major um, step on from traditional um, blockchains. So just to recap, you know, uh, people so far have been faced with this choice between using things like practical Byzantine fault tolerance, which is totally unsuitable for a decentralized network. The number of participants in the committee is very small, and you rely upon timeouts. So practical Byzantine fault tolerance has a leader. And if that leader doesn't produce messages within the timeout window, um, practical Byzantine fault tolerance moves into a sort of leader re-election phase, which is incredibly complex. And I think um, Thunder Coin, Thunder Token does this. It uses PBFT and then it sort of falls back to Ethereum to try and elect a new leader. And the problem is that there's a thing called the DDoS flatline attack. So and there's a bunch of them. Algo runs the same, all using these um, s uh, you know, partially synchronous consensus protocols, where if the leader doesn't produce a block before the timeout, um, you know, you either go into lead a re-election or you produce a nil block. So essentially you can stop, you know, if you can make, introduce a synchrony into the network, sufficient a synchrony into the network, right? Delays, essentially delays into the network by DDoSing it, for example. The thing just stops working. Um, albeit, you know, when it is working, it's, 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 it's quick. But we've, um, previously you've had to choose between something like that and, and a blockchain that's been very slow which nonetheless will continue proceeding under asynchrony, right? It's less vulnerable to um, changes in the speed of the network and so on. So we've um, kind of moved somewhere in the middle where we've got a protocol that's extremely fast. Um, given the committee size, probably, I would say, faster, considerably faster than traditional consensus protocols. But at the same time, has many of the lovely properties of a traditional blockchain, because it is a blockchain, albeit with some clever changes. And uh, that means it's more resistant and, and more robust, and, uh, much more secure, because you can uh, rely, up, rely upon um, much larger committees to um, drive consensus. So, uh, you know, that's how we, um, you know, drive agreement in Definity. We um, have this combination of threshold really and probabilistic slot consensus. And there's a whole lot of complexities, obviously, I haven't had a chance to go into, but, you know, we've covered the essentials, and it's actually not that complex, the system, and that's one of the nice things about it, that it's reason reasonably easy to reason about and implement, um, and, you know, that's this is the network that's been, uh, the test network, if you like, that's been demonstrated several times at different scales. Um, so, yeah, that's it for me. Um, uh, if you're interested in... Um, catching announcements from Definity, uh, follow me or the Definity um, project. Um, if you go to the Definity website, there's uh, um, a jobs page if you're a researcher or engineer um, into this kind of stuff. Um, you know, we'd love to hear from you. Okay.
That's it. I, I don't know if there's any like time for Q and A or no. Okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs>